let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Worker Co-ops, a solution for an economy in crisis. Um, my name is Eli Fagali. I'm the communications director at the New Economy Coalition. Um, and I'm really excited to see how many people are interested in worker co-ops and employee ownership um, as a strategy to building um, the economy that we need and we deserve. Um, over 600 people registered for uh, this webinar and over 200 people have already attending. Um, and it will be recorded and so folks who couldn't make it or who can't attend for the whole thing um, will send the link in a couple of days. Um, for those who are on live, um, you can ask a question to us, um, to our moderator, John, um, at any time uh, via the Zoom software. There's a question, a Q&A button um, on the bottom below the video. Um, if you're having trouble with that, uh, you could also just send a chat and we'll, we'll be scanning that throughout. Um, we also may answer some questions um, uh, just in the chat or in the Q&A interface. We, we definitely won't have time to answer everyone's questions, so we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, so I'm about to turn it over, but I just want to say that the New Economy Coalition, we're a network of 200, more than 200 groups um, who are building a new economy movement in the United States. Um, if you want to learn more about us and to get involved, visit neweconomy.net. Um, Again, my name is Eli Fagali, uh, and uh, I'm going to pass the mic to John Duda from the Democracy Collaborative to tell you more about himself um, and our other partners um, and to get this thing going. John, all you. All right. Thank you so much, Eli. Uh, so I myself am a, a worker owner at a 20 plus person worker cooperative, but today I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the Democracy Collaborative, which is a national and now international research and action institute operating as what we like to think of as an R&D lab for a more democratic economy. Uh, the Democracy Collaborative, I'm the director of communications. And I want to say I'm thrilled to be here today, thrilled that this conversation is happening. Would first of all love to thank the New Economy Coalition for putting this together, putting this ball rolling, bringing us together to make this webinar happen. Um, it's really an, an incredible thing to be in a field, uh, be in a movement, and have an organization like the New Economy Coalition that's just able to focus on being the backbone for this kind of collaboration. Um, it's something that is a, a really tremendous resource. And I also want to thank Mo uh, Mankline from the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, who also did a lot of the heavy lifting pulling this together, um, as well as all of our amazing panelists So I'll get to in a minute. Here, uh, at the Democracy Collaborative, we've been excited to play a, a role in what we see as a new movement around worker cooperatives. And I want to start, it's a new movement. Now, worker cooperatives have been around for a long, long, long time in, uh, in the U.S., at least back to the 19th century. But here, there's been at least a something of an exciting process going on. Uh, maybe started a decade and a half, two decades ago where people started to really intentionally begin to knit together what would become a national movement, um, really building on a lot of different fronts to accelerate the development of democratic workplaces. And one of the best parts of this new movement is that it really goes beyond what I'd call, um, because we're short on time, hippie alternatives. Now, not that there's anything wrong with hippie alternatives, but I'm really excited to be part of a movement that is able to center questions of racial and economic justice. And that focuses not just on carving out little tiny spaces of autonomy for a select few, but works on changing the game for everybody. Um, and this movement is having an effect. Uh, when we, we started a network of worker cooperatives here at the Democracy Collaborative called the Evergreen Cooperatives. It's a network of three uh, green businesses owned, operated by their workers that create jobs by supplying local nonprofit anchor institutions. When we started this project in Cleveland a um, uh, little over 10 years ago, worker co-ops were pretty much totally new, largely unintelligible, not to worker cooperative advocates, but certainly to policymakers, to funders, and so on. Uh, thanks in no small part to efforts like that of the Federation and its sister institute, the Democracy at Work Institute, which is one of the co-hosts of this webinar, this is really no longer the case at all. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of excitement, enthusiasm, awareness about worker cooperatives. One 
just small piece of data as an indication of that. We've got mayors from Madison, Wisconsin, to Jackson, Mississippi, to Newark, New Jersey, uh, to all across the country who are interested in building worker cooperatives into their economic development plans. And in many cases have actually done so uh, in really exciting and transformative ways. So we're no longer a new movement. Um, and I'd like to think we finally reached the end of the beginning. And now the fun part starts, right? This is the part with the even harder work where we get to take all of this wonderful possibility and promise that all of these projects across the country have demonstrated. And we actually get to roll up our sleeves and get to work building a more democratic and cooperative economy. And we've got a great, great set of panelists here today to help us sort through this question, to help us understand where worker co-ops are today and what this movement around democratic workplaces is doing to lay the foundations for success. We have with us Esteban Kelly, co-director of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. We have John O'Neill, senior policy. Uh, is John on yet? I saw him jump on with the phone. Okay. Uh, John O'Neill, senior policy analyst at the American Sustainable Business Council, and Kate Katif, coordinator of the Working World's National Peer Network. Um, I know at least two or uh, two out of the three of these folks are also active worker owners at worker co-ops themselves, but they're going to be talking more about big picture stuff in their comments. And we wanted to start by grounding this whole conversation to zoom in and start with a story that's local and inspiring to set the stage. And I'm thrilled that Molly Hemstreet, the uh, founder of Opportunity Threads Worker Cooperative in Morgantown, North Carolina, was able to join us today to help us do that. So Molly, could you briefly tell us your story? Where, what is Opportunity Threads? Where did it come from? How does it work? Sure. Um, it might be a little loud. I apologize for that. Um, but it's, uh, we are an active and growing um, factory here. We're growing factory here based in Branson, North Carolina. So I'm from Burke County, from Western North Carolina, which as you might hear or may not have known, is a lot of what's left of furniture and what is a lot of what's left of textiles. So when I was growing up here, um, a lot of that work left. Um, let me see, I'm getting a hard to hear you. Is that any better? Okay, all right. I'll just put my class and then I'll hand it off back to you and see where they're just going to be. So when I was growing up, a lot of this work was leaving, and I became really interested in bring this work back. Um, you can speak up, Molly, as loud as you can. We're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Um, so I was really interested in how we bring this work back um, to our communities. How does that individual look different? And Molly, it's it's still impossible to, to kind of parse it out. I think it's the background noise. It's like cutting the mic. Is there any way that you could? Yeah, let me call in real quick. Okay, yeah, that, that will work. Okay. Sorry, sorry everybody. Um, this, is, this is what it means to, to hear stories from folks that are at work, in their workplace, in a factory. Um, and we really appreciate uh, Molly taking the time to do this today. Can you me maybe? No, Molly, I'm not sure if you if you called in as a panelist. I'll send you that information right now. Um hold on. Yeah. See. And and Molly's with Opportunity Threads. Folks want to look look, uh, look them up while we're. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you real quick. All right. So while we're waiting for Molly to um, get started, I think we will kind of let's see. Is she calling in now? All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just ask Esteban a little bit um, to fill us in a little bit on his organization while we're waiting for Molly. We'll swing back around to her in a second. 
So I just want if you could, um, as the director of the U.S. Federation for Worker Cooperatives, you're in a good position to tell us kind of what's going on in the movement, where the U.S. Federation sees strategies for growing power uh, nationally and locally. So can you talk a little bit about what you're up to? Yeah, we're up to a lot. Um, and if every month that we have this conversation, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a different conversation because of how quickly the context is changing and um, the depth of our relationships with allies and other partners. Um, but real briefly, there's sort of basically three things that we're really focusing on doing. Um, the first is around strengthening uh, our members themselves. So our members are not the individual workers, but we're organized as, um, as like a chamber of commerce or a trade association for the worker co-op business form. Um, and so each of those cooperative members, we have a couple hundred of them, uh, we're really focused on strengthening them in two aspects. One is the business itself and the other is the workers. Um, <clears throat> so with the workers, we're trying to help them um, grow and strengthen by supporting some of their health and really working on a health, a health equity initiative. Uh, we've just launched a dental plan nationally. This was our first time doing it this year. We're adding a vision plan next year. Um, and we're helping people figure out how to navigate the changing landscape of the Affordable Care Act and the ways that they can ensure their members, um, including, you know, regardless of, regardless of their status, documentation, um, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> we're also helping to grow and strengthen those, those members as workers through investing in their leadership and doing a fair amount of training and leadership development. Um, in the business side, it's some of the traditional things that we just want to make sure our members are able to get access to. So uh, really turning up their aptitude around marketing and having a market orientation, and including linking up the markets for worker co-ops to do business with one another, um, with other local and sustainable um, and even cooperative businesses, whether that's here or overseas. Um, Molly and Opportunity Threads are involved in some of that um, what we call principle six initiative, um, really citing the sixth cooperative principle around cooperation among cooperatives and the ways in which that has a market orientation that we can really um, utilize. Um, and the other is really just doubling down on the industries themselves. So the ways that businesses, <clears throat> cooperative businesses, um, when, when you're looking at something like the textile industry that uh, in Molly's case, linking them up with um, people who are doing silk screening, printing, um, and places where you can sell um, some of those goods at conferences or in grocery stores, cooperative grocery stores and things like that. So finding all different kinds of ways that we can um, enter into um, conversations around building a more favorable business environment with, within particular industries, whether that's transportation or IT or healthcare, um, domestic work, uh, home cleaning and things like that. So we strengthen our businesses, uh, we offer connectivity, um, really helping to connect work that's happening on the ground um, to communities, to consumers, to allies, to movement facing groups, um, even connecting with the alt labor sector. So people who are organizing in worker centers or the National Domestic Workers Alliance or the Restaurant Opportunity Center. So regardless of um, what the industry is or what the workers are facing, really trying to link up you know, freelance workers with folks who are um, in, in allied spaces um, as we begin to build power. Um, and then the last is really around advocacy, that we advocate um, in both the um, public policy space um, as well as um, within the industry space themselves. So we're advocating for things to be more sustainable, more transparent, um, to really shift what is the sort of gold standard or what, you know, what are, what are we expecting within a particular uh, market? Um, we, can, we can advocate for taxi drivers to be paid a fair livable wage and really push back against the gig economy. Um, so those are things that we're doing um, in, in a lot, kind of at a, at a high level. Um, and that advocacy work in the public space really is happening at all different levels. We're working uh, with the Senate, um, through Senator Gillibrand's office uh, from New York, um, Senator Sanders from Vermont, of course, um, and even on the House side through Keith Ellison's office, um, all the way down to, as you started kind of foreshadowing a little bit, working with uh, mayors and city councils, um, and even people at the state level. Uh, we just had a win that I heard about this morning uh, over in Sacramento where uh, our members especially at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, who sort of lead the coalition work that we're doing in California, we're able to update um, and amend the state statute around uh, worker co-op 
policy. So we're sort of everywhere doing everything, linking up with international partners, other worker co-op federations in other countries, um, and the International Worker Co-op Federation itself, which is based in Brussels. That's fantastic. Thank you for that overview. And it's great to have an organization that is um, run by uh, worker cooperatives for worker cooperatives, because as we know, uh, worker cooperatives, you know, people have jobs being worker cooperators, and they sometimes take time out of their busy work days to talk to us, but they can't do it all the time. So we're especially grateful, Molly, for you being able to take time out of your work day and also uh, figure out how to make a webinar work on a busy shop floor, uh, which is, I think, a first, at least in my experience. So if you could go ahead and tell us your story, we, I think everybody would love to hear it. Can you, can you hear me now? Okay, yay, <laughs> yay. Um, and now it's actually gotten quiet because everyone's gone out for their afternoon soccer game, but we'll, <laughs> we'll try again. <laughs> so again, my name is Molly Hemstreet and I am in Western North Carolina, the heart of a lot of textile and furniture manufacturing, which I saw leave as a, a young woman and came back into my community. Um, my partner was working at a worker center at the time, helping with um, unionized the local processing plant here, which is chicken processing, another North Carolina industry. So I really saw this economy pulled out from under us. And I also saw the challenge for unionization in a place like the rural South. And I really became driven by this question of, well, can we try to figure out how to own our plants with the workers that are owning them? Um, and so we've luckily been surrounded by many, many, many mentors, many of them from the US Federation, the Democracy at Work Institute, that we couldn't have done it without them. And so we did, we've started um, a factory. I'm gonna pull it up here, um, um, try not to cut myself off so that you can see it. Um, see if you can see some of our folks here. We started in a worker center. We had one sewing machine um, and now we've moved in. We're about, we have about 10,000 square feet now um, and we have 23 workers and we've actually are saving to produce our own, or build our own facility within the next two to three years. We have an interesting, we really believe in what we call the triple bottom line. So I don't know if you can see all of these boxes right here. Um, can you see all of our boxes right here? We had about 200 of those come in today and our largest um, company that we work for is actually, we, do, we upcycle people's t-shirts into t-shirt blankets and we were, lucky, I guess, to be the Facebook, um, their holiday Facebook um, ad for this year with Project Repat. But this week, our team of about 15 people were upcycle between 24 and 30,000 t-shirts. So when we really think about being a worker cooperative, it is about the social aspect of it, but is also about the environmental aspect of it, and then the economic aspect of it. So we are in a very, very busy time right now um, as running a as running a company in the textile industry because so much of this work is coming back. A lot of it's because people are cooperating together. Um, one thing that we've been able to do is that we have been able to build actually a network. So we didn't want to just be kind of a, a lone cooperative out there in this industry. So we worked with some of our economic developers, um, traditional economic developers, and a really neat R&D facility, research and development facility down the way to pull together something that is really kind of a a network of cooperatives um, or a network of businesses that function somewhat as a cooperative association called the Carolina Textile District. So we're not just one company of 24 workers, even though that's really wonderful. We're also a network of over 400 workers, which can start to have more and more impact on the industry. Because as um, John was saying in the, in the introduction, we want to forward the movement of cooperativism within our own plants. But we also really want to think about how we change industry and how, you know, when my children who I want to live here and grow up here can have a cooperative on every corner in a place like the rural manufacturing South. So right now we have 23 workers. That's a combination of owners, um, people that are coming in or um, their pre-members. Some of the women that were standing behind me as the, the webinar was coming in our pre-members and also just employees people that we hope will become um, members of our cooperative. It's not obligatory, but we would um, create that pathway for them. Our buy-in right now is at $5,000, um, which you might look and say, huh, that's pretty steep for a low margin industry, but it's because we're creating a workplace that has such value to it. And just, I can't put in enough plugs for the US Federation. Part of the reason we have value in our workplace is because we partner with them. 
so that we can have dental and vision, working on health insurance, um, more and more things that we're able to add. So not only is it a good job, a hard job, but a good job, but a job that more and more has strength to it and longevity. And I will really say that in the market of uh, what a cooperative is now in the textile industry, so much of uh, learning about the market and the demand is about customization of, um, you know, we make these blankets and every single one that all, every single 800 ones that go out the door this week will be different. Um, and that's the name of the game in a lot of domestic manufacturing is how, is how do you customize your work? And we could only do that if people cared about their work. And the reason that people care about their work is because they, at the end of the day, they own this work. Um, so it's, a, it's an, important, an important model, but also a critical model, I think, to really be competitive now in a U.S. market. So um, please, you know, look us up and uh, let us know if we can participate with anything. And hopefully you can buy some of our bags that we'll be making with other cooperatives through the Principle 6 project. And um, we welcome you coming and visiting us or also um, learning about some more of our worker owners as they're able to participate in webinars and things like this. So our shop floor, one more look at it. It's a great place. I'm really proud. I couldn't imagine um, working in any other place or with any other model other than a worker owned business. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly. Uh, I think we have, uh, I think you need to get back to work. So uh, do you have time to take one question? Sure. Yeah, um, so I think, uh, let's see, does anybody, uh, we're looking at questions here. Um, I will give people a chance to type one in, um, but I will just say, um, are there other ways that people can support Opportunity Threads beyond, uh, you know, if they don't need a t-shirt blanket, um, what are some other ways that people might be able to do that? Sure, so, you know, we, we are contract labor. Contract labor is, in and of itself somewhat extractive. It's a lot of the story of manufacturing in a place like the, the rural South. Um, so it is important though, the, those folks that we work with, we need their companies to be strong. They need us to be strong, we need them to be strong. So going on and supporting the products that we make for other people is actually a really important thing because that we work very hard on negotiating good contracts. Most of the contracts we're working with now, um, we have a lot of longevity to them. Um, so I would say yes, support the companies that we work with. We're also, in addition, you know, working, as Esteban already said, um, about developing some of our own lines so that the margin comes back to the worker. I think ultimately what we need to do is we need to own our floor. We need to own our floor space and our means of production. Um, we need to own the networks and more and more deeply into the industry. And then we need to own more of the market. So it's that combination where we can really take the margin into the hands of the workers. And so I think as we look to develop more and more of our products, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> um, we're putting more and more minds around that. Um, and then I think just encouraging, we, mainly we, more than Facebook, we do things more such as Instagram. So I think supporting um, the beauty behind the work, not just the beautiful things we make, but the wonderful people that are behind that story and help us continue to tell that story, I, I think is really, really important. Um, we're interestingly going to start a program in Guatemala this year our cooperative has been thankfully successful. A lot of our workers are immigrant workers. They are from Guatemala. And so um, stay tuned on that project because they, in having a little bit, you know, have made a little bit, um, they wanted to give back, which is also, you know, it's part of the cooperative spirit. It's another means of the principle six of always cooperatives helping other cooperatives. And so we're interested in starting a program in Guatemala. So we'll let you know as we, as we know what that starts to look like. Cool. And there was one other kind of set of questions uh, from the audience, which was kind of where do you find people to become part of the, uh, where do you, you know, where do you find people to hire? How do those people become free members? What's the difference between a free member and an employee? And then how does the buy, -in, how does the buy-in work? Sure. Um, so a lot of this is word of mouth. You know, we started with a core. So we started in a worker center, which is, was a good place for us to incubate. Um, they gave us a little bit of space. We were able to get some donated equipment. It was really important for us that we understand our assets. So if people are starting out as cooperatives, know what people in your communities have done for generations. You might, you know, we, we have equipment, we have space, we had, um, even though people often write off the textile industry, there's still a lot of it left. And so we were able to build out of the shell of that industry. And so there were people that were skilled that were here. 
Um, we, you know, a lot of those are in the immigrant community and we were able to find those workers and then they have family members and they now, you know, recruit other family members. We do have a rule. You can only have two family members. So no more than that. So that there's no voting familial blocks when key decisions are being made. Um, but so that we've been able to find people locally. We usually bring them in. We have several um, workers that train them. We look those less around hard skill and more around the soft skill. So how quickly does someone, you know, how does someone think about solving conflicts or how does someone work in a team? So we give people a trial period in which they can come in and we can kind of really see their soft skills as much as their hard skills because we feel like we can teach the sewing skills. Um, so people, you know, have a time period anywhere from, we, we have a relatively long time period for people to come in every, anywhere from like two years to three years that they will be an employee and then what we call a pre-member. After that time, then they buy in. We have a $5,000 buy-in. Half of that is paid through sweat equity, and then half of that is paid $25 out of their paycheck every week. And most of our owners have actually paid that all off at this point. And we have a new crop coming in, which we're really, really excited about. So I think part of the, one of the questions was, how is that $5,000 paid? So a lot of it is a combination of, uh, there's a board over here, a whiteboard where you can see our skills or, or we can, you can see the productivity of every person. It's a transparent way in which we go around, not as kind of a, an overseer, but more as kind of consistent feedback. This is more of a characteristic of lean manufacturing. So if you're gonna be a manufacturer, it's not just being about a cooperative, you have to run a good manufacturing floor. And so we learn a lot about lean manufacturing, which has helped us be successful. So we give good feedback on the skill development, and then we also look and we do evaluations around the softer skills of how you get along, how you solve problems, how you help someone behind you, how you deal with, you know, 800 boxes sitting over here. Does it stress you out or can we work as a team to figure it out? And we provide assessments on worker owners that are coming in in that way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly, for giving us that very yeah. brief but Thank super you all. of the nuts and bolts for, I think, a lot of folks who if you're a little newer to worker co-ops. Um, so I want to move on to some of our other panelists um, and get a sense from them of their work with worker co-ops and their efforts to help scale this movement. Um, so I thought I would go to John O'Neill, who's on, uh, joining us via phone uh, from the American Sustainable Business Council. And John, I was wondering if you could just tell us why, uh, why worker co-ops are a part of the American Sustainable Business Council's policy agenda. What's so valuable and important about them from your perspective? Well, thank you for having me, and I apologize for being late getting on earlier. Uh, ASBC is a, is a, an organization that advocates for sustainable economics, uh, and, and, and that includes the, um, uh, the maintenance of uh, uh, jobs that pay well. It includes uh, encouraging people to, to take ownership of their uh, economic uh, um, livelihoods, and, and, and cooperatives simply fit into, uh, include each of those things. And uh, from, from an economic perspective, it, it, um, um, the, the, the retirement of the baby boomer businesses uh, up to 20,000 a year for the next decade is a, is a seismic shift in, um, uh, in the uh, US economy. And, and the danger is that, uh, that uh, too many of those will, will, uh, will have to close. Those businesses will have to close either for lack of a buyer or um, uh, for or being absorbed. Uh, and, and, and that's a net loss for, for a workforce that's already struggling badly, as we all know. So the, the, anything we can do to help, um, most particularly help Congress to, to understand the issue and to generate supports for it, uh, for, for transitions from traditional businesses to worker-owned businesses is a, is a, is a net plus in, in our estimation. We work, uh, we have a, a, a ownership for all campaign and we do that with, uh, in, in, uh, in co collaboration with One Worker, One Vote, which is a pro-union cooperative organization headed by Michael Peck, who is a member of ASBC's board. So we, um, in, in, the, in the last several months, uh, we have been uh, on the hill a, a great deal. One of, one of the things that we've been working very hard on is to help uh, Senator Gillibrand uh, from New York, a Democratic senator from New York, to, to, to find a Republican co-sponsor for a bill that would essentially rev up the Small Business Administration in terms of its attitude and support for uh, cooperatives, uh, employee stock ownership plans, that sort of thing. And, and the, the principal pieces of that bill are that uh, uh, that um, 
existing businesses that, that get the SBA grants, uh, should they transition to, um, uh, to uh, worker co-ops or ESOPs, would, um, would maintain their, uh, their uh, contracting status. If they, if they are uh, veteran women, minority-owned uh, businesses, that they would maintain their contracting status vis-a-vis -vis the SBA uh, despite the transition to, uh, to, to, this, to this other form. Um, the, another piece of Jill of Brand's bill is, is simply to, is to, is to beef up the, the education uh, available uh, to, to the public at large through small business development centers. And, and, and the education would have to do with the, um, the, the practical uh, possibility of uh, worker co-ops and, and, uh, and uh, broadly owned ESOPs, that kind of thing. So that is, that is one of the bills that we've been, we've been working on. There are other bills at the, uh, at the um, federal level um, two of the more prominent ones uh, relate to ESOPs because it's uh, because ESOPs are, are something that's somewhat more familiar to to uh, even uh, even conservative members of Congress since since uh, we as we all know ESOPs can can stop short of uh, of worker control but but uh, there there are bills that would um, that would uh, uh, apply the, the tax advantages to to uh, to ESOPs equally across the types of ESOPs. We, we uh, advocate for including worker co-ops in, 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 in those bills so that, so that there's parity in terms of federal tax support uh, for, for worker cooperatives uh, with, with, with ESOPs. And again, this is all in, with an eye toward, uh, uh, toward uh, addressing this issue of, of this uh, landslide of, um, of um, boomer businesses uh, uh, shutting down. Um, the... Um, well, that's that's essentially that's that's a bulk of it. We we most of our efforts have been uh, on Congress so far. You know, a couple of interesting points. We were we were up lobbying um, members of the tax committees uh, about two weeks ago, and and one of the things that struck me was how completely open at least the tax staffers are to to the idea of worker cooperatives. They tend to not know them. As well as they know ESOPs, but they but they are open to learning about them, and and, and ultimately, I believe in, in incorporating uh, worker cooperatives' needs in their in their, in their legislation. The other is the other piece is that some of them don't know much at all. I was speaking to the uh, the tax aide to uh, Senator Cardin, who is of uh, Maryland, my senator, who is uh, who has a bill that would uh, equalize the tax treatment of ESOPs, whether they're S corps or C corps. These are business forms. Uh, and uh, and I was talking to her. I think you know why don't you why, why don't I include worker cooperatives in the uh, in the bill? And she said, well, you know, it never occurred to me. I, I, so so we're we're bringing her up to speed on on on, on what worker cooperatives are and why they are uh, the equivalent, if not substantially better, in, in terms of uh, uh, long term uh, ownership and, and and management of a business. Um, I am I'm I'm somewhat aware of what's happening at the state level and and. And I sometimes think that what's happening at the state level is is as fertile or more in terms of uh, advocacy, uh, but it, it depends upon on the particular states. So again, w our our thing is that we're, we're a business organization. We're a business organization that believes the economy should be sustainable in terms of uh, providing a decent living to to, uh, to to people, and and in terms of uh, helping people to to own their uh, their economic uh, future in a in a, uh, in a more full and, and uh, satisfying way. Thank you, John. That was a great summary of the, the policy case and the policy landscape at the federal level. Uh, I want to turn now to Kate Katib from The Working World uh, to fill in another piece of this puzzle, which is the capital piece. Um, and I was hoping you could share your own worker ownership story um, and specifically how being involved in a, a major worker cooperative expansion helped you understand the need for more financing options for democratic workplaces. Sure, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that I always like to remind people is that access to capital, we talk about it a lot as, as an issue for worker cooperatives, but access to capital is an issue for all small businesses. Um, but there are some unique challenges for worker-owned cooperatives who are trying to find financing. Um, you know, it gets a little bit easier um, to finance a business when you're already big um, and your business has significant assets to leverage, but especially when you're a startup um, or a buyout 
or a small operation, you often run into um, this persistent problem of personal guarantees. So my worker co-op is um, Red Emma's. We're a 25, uh, 25 worker cooperative in Baltimore. We're a restaurant uh, and bookstore. Uh, we have 20 worker owners and five that are on the pathway towards ownership. Um, but five years ago, we were significantly smaller than that. Um, and we were looking to expand. Um, we wanted to add um, other aspects to what we did. So instead of just being a cafe, we wanted to be able to, um, you know, import coffee into the country and roast it so that we could have control of that supply chain, which was our biggest commodity at that point. Um, so we developed a plan for expansion. Um, we had 10 years of experience and 10 years of moderately positive cash flow under our belts at that point, but we didn't have a lot of cash in the bank. Um, and we didn't have a, a, lot of, a lot of monetizable assets. We were still pretty, pretty small, um, operating pretty close to the margin. So we went to area banks, some that we'd had relationships with for a long time, um, and we tried to apply for loans. And every single time it came back to the same thing. If you want a loan, you have to provide personal guarantees. Your business is not big enough to be the collateral for these loans. So there has to be something else that you're going to leverage. Now, this is the service industry. I mean, most of us have been working in low wage jobs our entire adult lives. Most of us don't have a lot of personal assets. Lots of us honestly didn't have good credit or any credit at all at that point. So the banks would look at us and, and all of our paperwork and they would say, okay, well, you've got a few people in your worker co-op who own houses or have some savings, put them on the application and we'll approve the loan on the basis of their personal guarantees. Well, that's a problem. Um, aside from the imbalance that it introduces into what is supposed to be a, a horizontal ownership structure, it reinforces precisely the same structural inequality that keeps poor people poor and wealthy people wealthy. You have to have money to get money. And beyond that, when you're worrying about trying to get your business to break even after a major expansion or as a startup, you know, you really don't need to be worrying about whether or not the bank is going to come and take your house and put you and your kids out on the street just because you missed a loan payment. Um, we realized pretty quickly that we needed and were having trouble finding financing solutions that weren't extractive, that didn't penalize workers when things didn't go exactly as planned. Um, so we started looking around um, and we... Um, found the working world, uh, who was just starting to lend in the U.S. at that point, then been lending primarily in, in Argentina and Nicaragua. Um, and through the working world, we ended up in contact with a whole national network of co-ops, workers, community organizers, and, and movement organizations who were looking at this problem from different angles. So trying to figure out how you take money out of the extractive economy and put it to work in ways that would build real community wealth for the people in the places that have been systematically excluded from economic security. Um, you know, like Molly was saying with Opportunity Threads, for us at Red Emma's, we weren't really just interested in figuring out how to fund ourselves. I mean, yeah, that was important to us, but it was a much larger question. Um, it was, it was, um, it became a pressing issue because we learned from our own experience that for co-ops to take root at any kind of scale um, and for us to adequately be able to promote the model and encourage other people to be starting worker-owned cooperatives, we had to come up with ways to reduce the barriers to capital. Um, so two years ago, we worked with the working world and the rest of this network to launch what's now um, sort of unofficially called the Financial Cooperative, which is a group of 14 place-based um, or community-rooted loan funds that are supported by the working world's infrastructure that really um, understand the unique challenges of financing worker and community-controlled enterprises and businesses and can help provide access to capital using mechanisms that um, not just respect, but also I think celebrate the needs of democratic ownership structures. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Um, so, Esteban, I wanted to go back over to you for a second, um, and there's two things I wanted to know. Um, one is to, if you could give us a sense about numbers, about where we're at as a movement, um, what are the latest statistics on worker ownership, and what does it tell us about how the movement is growing. But I also wanted to fill in, I think, one of the pieces of the puzzle that's been floated a little bit, uh, which is conversions. Um, and make sure that you can oh, look, tell us a little bit about conversions because when I went through the, the webinar registrations and looked at you know what were people interested in what questions did I have it was like something something conversion something conversion something conversions 
Uh, so people are really excited about conversions, and I want to make sure we have some, some substantial discussion of that um, on, this, on this panel. So you can take whichever one first. Uh, well, I'm going to start with the general sort of landscape of, of where we're at and what's, what we know. Um, the funny thing about this, there's a bit of an uncertainty principle, <clears throat> which I think is true of almost all data. Um, but for us and, and studying the sector, the year we collect information is the year after the, that business has happened, right? So you run your business in 2015, you close your books. Sometime in 2016, we can poke you for that info. We collect that and then we spit it back out in 2017. So the stuff that we know with certainty is about a year and a half or two years old. Um, but we're pretty decent at, at estimating and extrapolating from that based on trends and, and what we have a sense of. Um, so generally, worker co-ops, um, they're growing. We're growing at a modest pace. I mean, it feels quick to us because of how small we started. Um, but, uh, but we are, you know, we are seeing a lot of growth. A majority of that growth is actually through conversion, so I'm excited to, to chat about that. Um, a little more and see what kind of questions y'all have about that, about that work. Um, there is, I mean, just to give a sense of the scale of this, about two thirds of worker co-ops um, back in 2015 were less than 15 years old. So, I mean, that's the vast majority of them uh, are pretty new um, to, to our sector. <clears throat> and about 40% of them were less than five years old. So this is like the scale of, of how quickly things are growing and changing. Um, there, is a, um, there is a concentration in certain industries. Um, a lot of it is some light manufacturing, um, service sector industries, you know, restaurants and catering, um, uh, home cleaning, housekeeping, um, and, and some, you know, some retail, which could be anything from a coffee shop, like the Red Emma's example, um, or a bike shop or some of the restaurants, bars and cafes um, that are part of our membership. So we're sort of all over the place, even some uh, worker run grocery stores um, like Mandela Foods Market in, in Oakland. It's a, a black owned um, and operated grocery store that's operating in a place that um, might be considered a food desert um, by a lot of other statistics. So that's kind of where, where we're at, <clears throat> but also who we are is shifting. Um, about 70% of all of the workers um, in our workforce are female. Um, and that, I mean, I'm always struck by that statistic um, coming across that that has, that has been true for uh, uh, several years now. Um, but then on top of that, about 60% are people of color. So we've already shifted, and again, this is the old data from two years ago, we've already shifted to being majority people of color um, as a workforce, as a sector, um, and actually the largest plurality of any race are Latinx workers at about 43%, uh, followed kind of closely by white workers at around 40% or so. Um, so that's like a little bit about who, who we are and, and where we are. Um, we're also seeing growth concentrated in ecosystems, and um, that's a bit of a buzzword, um, but there's a reason for that, which is that worker co-op growth and development <clears throat> really uh, requires a, a rich environment, the way that ecosystems work. You know, if you're gardening and you have nutrient deficient soil, or you have all the nutrition in the world, but there isn't enough irrigation, there's not water, uh, or, um, or you don't have the seeds themselves, it doesn't matter how much water and nutrients you have, you need you know, a combination of all of those things happening um, to grow uh, whatever it is that you're trying to grow. And so with worker co-ops, it's a similar thing. Kate just gave a really detailed <clears throat> example of one component of that ecosystem, which is around the financing. Um, so there's all those different pieces to it. You need to have lenders who know what a worker co-op even is, who are able to lend, um, businesses, that, um, that have the kind of marketing plan um, where, the, where it can pass the muster of underwriting, um, people who are providing technical assistance, cooperative professionals, lawyers and bookkeepers, um, people who can file their taxes, all of that stuff, just like any other business. Um, so a lot of the same reasons that the federal government and local state governments have supported small businesses by creating things like small business um, administrations or even sustainable um, business associations we need all of those similar um, supports. <clears throat> the problem is that it's a big country. There's all this space. 
So you start to get at an economy of scale, which is the idea of an ecosystem, a concentration where you hit critical mass of enough of those elements. You have academics and researchers studying things, connecting people up. You have organizers. Um, you have a market. You know, you have c customers, whether they're um, behind the scenes or really uh, publicly facing consumers who are able to source um, through procurement policies or just through buying and shopping from those businesses. Um, and of course you have the businesses themselves and the direct co-op developers and TA providers. So there's all these different elements um, of an ecosystem, a, a lot of which are things that we learned from ecosystems overseas that have had a really a much stronger worker co-op sector, um, such as in, in Spain um, and in the Mondragon um, co-op um, ecosystem. So that's kind of where we got that, that idea from. Um, and so we're seeing growth really concentrated in, in certain places. Um, a lot of it in, I think a lot of the, ex the established and existing co-ops in the Midwest, kind of up in the upper Midwest in the Twin Cities and around um, Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I, the largest ecosystem has been in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. That's actually about to be overtaken by New York City, where we've seen a tremendous amount of support through direct uh, or rather indirect funding from city council. So they've put discretionary funds at this point, I think it's been about $8 million over the course of the last four or five years, um, put into nonprofits who are supporting worker co-op development indirectly. And they've managed to, um, I think, quadruple the number of co-ops in New York. And so they're about to have more than the Bay Area. And then of course, New England has a really, really strong um, worker co-op ecosystem. Um, it's a little less visible because of the nature of rural communities. So places like Vermont and Western Massachusetts, um, it's hard to know unless you live there. And then you're of course dialed in and you're very aware of how strong those ecosystems are. Um, but of course, places like Boston, um, it's kind of hard to miss how, uh, how strong the worker co-ops are over there. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I think before we go to the convergence question, I want to ask a, a follow-up question to, to Kate um, and to think a little bit about, you know, um, I think as Tavon started getting at this with this question of the ecosystem and the support, um, you know, I had asked you about capital um, and capital access. And obviously capital access is a problem. You know, we would love it if more people were throwing more money at worker co-ops. I don't think anybody on this panel would disagree with that. Um, but what else do we need um, from your position as someone um, building a local ecosystem for worker co-ops? Um, what else, what other kinds of support do we need uh, to make this capital access effective? I think the support question is important, but I want to back up oh, one Kate. step before that. What's that? I was going to Kate to this one. Oh, you're going to Kate. Yeah, sorry. But I'm interested in Esteban's answer. <laughs> uh, I'll keep mine short. Um, so, you know, we need, um, I mean, there are, um, there are so many things that we could do to help support um, cooperative development. Um, money is, a, is obviously a big piece of it. Capital is, is important. Um, don't, get, don't get me wrong. Money is a great tool. Um, but you have to know how to use it to your advantage for it to be a tool um, rather than for it to be a, a kind of a weapon. There is this pervasive strategy for community economic development that sort of relies on a model that just dumps a bunch of money into disinvested neighborhoods and says, okay, great, there you go. We made you some businesses, we built you some houses, see ya. Um, that is not um, the most effective model. And it's not something that has proven to be super effective um, in helping to support worker cooperatives. Um, basic financial literacy actually isn't something that we all grow up with. And even those of us who might have taken a business class in school um, or grown up in a family that owned a business, you know, we weren't necessarily taught all of those skills or we didn't necessarily have the, the time or ability to, to learn those. So, you know, going back to the personal credit issue, um, a lot of people have bad or no credit because they never developed the skills to manage personal finances and business financials you know, it's not rocket science, but it takes some doing to fully understand it. And without someone in your business who understands the financial model, it's hard to operate as strategically as you can. You know, in a traditional model, you might have an owner or a manager or a CFO who is the person that really understands all the parts of that financial model. 
Um, but businesses are stronger when you have a majority of the workers who understand um, the financial aspects that go into supporting that business. At Ren Emma's, I'm a, I'm a cook. In most businesses, the line cooks don't really get training in business development. But from our perspective, if our cooks don't understand the financial model, then we make all kinds of bad decisions that make it really hard for us to break even as a restaurant. And that means that the business suffers. Um, and without fully understanding how the business works financially, it's hard to fully participate in the ownership culture of the business. So, you know, again, I know this is kind of still pushing on the financial aspect of it, but, but adequate training and support for all workers in worker-owned cooperatives to really fully um, get to a point of basic financial literacy, both around personal finances and around business financials is absolutely key to setting worker cooperatives up for success. I absolutely cannot stress that enough. And coupling that with the process of development and coupling that with the process of lending is something that the working world has really done a lot of um, and has really instilled in all of the funds that are a part of the financial cooperative. Um, so I see that as really being a, a key element. Um, I think the other thing, and I think Esteban can speak to this certainly um, as well, is the need for integrating um, cooperative models into um, business development support at a, at a city and, and state level. Um, right now in Baltimore, um, if you go to the Small Business Administration and you say, I want to start a worker-owned cooperative, they look at you like you're completely nuts. That needs to not happen. It needs to be the case that this is offered amongst you know, a, a variety of other options and strategies just as regularly as, as forming another, another um, kind of, of business. Can I jump in? Oh, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, go for it. Um, so, so it is 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 part it's going going to this question of whether whether or not uh, people are ready for the for the roles that that, uh, that come with owning and running their own company. The um, the, the small business development centers that, that exist. You know, if, if if we can get these things um, both trained and and beefed up in terms of their own knowledge, you could you could go uh, you could you could add a substantial piece to to prepping people for the transitions, but but you also have to have uh, people who are um, expert enough to to help uh, say the the owner of the existing business to decide whether whether his his uh, his business model is right for for transition. So there, there's there's there are kind of multiple levels of uh, of both training and and uh, uh, consideration that that are that are um, that, that that both the federal and state governments could go some some distance to. Uh, to, to beefing up uh, to prepare people to succeed uh, under these uh, under these kinds of approaches. Thank you, uh, Esteban. Do you want to jump in here on the question of support and maybe also the question of conversions, which John brought us to? Well, Kate said the main thing I was going to say, which is that we think about what are the other elements, and it's like business, you guys. <laughs> it's business. <laughs> Everyone's like, what about deep solidarity and all of your feelings? <laughs> Um, yo, like we really, um, we're talking about people who traditionally um, were using worker co-ops as a tool to exit the economy as an alternative, like, well, oh, society's messed up. Let me do, go do my own thing and run my bakery over here. And now worker co-ops and part of the growth we're seeing in that demographic shift is because it's being used as a tool from folks who have been excluded from economic progress and using worker co-ops as a way to enter the formal economy and to start tapping in um, to some of that economic progress. And so those are often not people who've had um, a lot of opportunities for mentorship around understanding finances or marketing or any of those things. A lot of it is entrepreneurial. Hey, I have a thing I like doing. Let me formalize that or maybe let me cooperativize that. Um, and not so much, you know, filling out a business canvas and understanding your value proposition um, and doing like clear storytelling and, and branding. Um, so some of that stuff is, um, is, I mean, I think it's, it's, um, it's actually encouraging that we live in a time where the rest of the world is saturated with a lot of those skills. And so it's really just a matter of porting that over um, to some folks in our own community. I think the other side besides the business piece is, um, is really about connectivity um, to cycle back to the piece I was saying earlier. And that's why um, that's part of our value proposition. What we think is really so important that businesses trying to solve those problems all on their own because of a sort of DIY ethic or a grassroots ethic or an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and I think one of the things that's really helpful is starting to link together businesses that have a similar profile with one another. 
So you can be in the same industry. Uh, we have a, a council for our members that are all in the tech co-op world. And so they have their own channel. They talk to each other. They have their own meetings. They refer clients back and forth to one another. You know, hey, our docket's too full. Here's some extra business. Do you want it? Or what do you do to solve this kind of problem with Drupal? And they talk to each other. Um, so we're doing that in a lot of different industries, solar and other kinds of industries, um, or for co-ops that are of a similar type. So for example, we are taking our members who uh, are recent conversions, because of course, a lot of our strongest members all come out of conversions, you know, whether that happened in the late 70s or the early 90s, conversions are um, often invisible as, as being kind of the bedrock of the US worker co-op sector. So I wanna like lift that up first of all. Um, and one of the ways that we're offering that connectivity is by launching a, a co-op council for our, within our membership of groups that have converted recently and are dealing with some of those questions around um, management things, uh, ownership culture, because that, that is a different thing than figuring out, you know, what's your brand? Maybe you've been in operations for 15 or 20 years and you're not having the same kind of questions that a startup might have. Excellent. Um, so I want to um, just say, first of all, that I'm like overwhelmed with the amount of amazing questions that are being asked uh, in the chat. Uh, and I'm looking at them like, oh, that's, a, that's like an hour long thing. Oh, that's like a whole separate webinar. Um, so I would encourage people to keep asking those because we are going to, we are going to pull those together. Whatever we don't get to on the webinar, we'll circulate it between the organizers and the panelists, and we'll try and get at least pointers to all of those questions asked, even if we don't get them answered live. Um, I want to um, just uh, kind of throw it out there. We've heard a little bit about policy. Um, we've heard uh, quite a bit about federal policy. Um, but John, or anybody else who's um, on the panel, if you can give us a sense, what are the um, the state and local policies that you're most excited about? I know we heard a little bit about New York, but what else is going on that people should know about and be excited about? Uh, and this is John, I, I can jump in a little bit. Uh, the, the, the federal government has uh, actually has a, a, a long tradition in uh, support of cooperatives within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but but cooperatives and ESOPs are are overseen by by a number of uh, federal agencies. So so one of the efforts that's underway is to try and have the agencies uh, educate one another uh, so that so that they're all up to speed. And, and moreover, to, um, uh, to to help them identify goals that they, that they can they can uh, support each other, sort of more more ambitious kinds of goals, so that there there is that kind of, a, of an effort uh, underway already uh, within uh, within the uh, the federal government. Uh, I, just uh, uh, in ter in terms of uh, going back to the issue of, of what people in Congress know and don't know about about cooperatives, it, it, whenever whenever you have a chance, whenever your your members have a chance to to educate their congressman or their senator on on how on sort of the n normalcy of, of worker cooperatives, and in fact, it's just another uh, business model. It, it it can go a long way to toward making them more receptive to these kinds of messages when they they get up on the hill, because it, 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 part of it is is what they don't know, uh, and 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 really outreach from from people at the state and local levels to their to their federal employees can can do a lot to. Uh, uh, to opening their minds to, to how normal this stuff can be. Other policy developments, um, especially at the state or local level that folks are excited about? Well, to me, most of the exciting stuff is happening at the municipal level. Um, state level stuff is, is important and interesting. And uh, what we've seen around um, in the US context historically no cooperative sector has gotten to scale without a partner in government, in particular the federal government, um, whether that's through ag policy or credit unions, rural electric cooperative, things like that. So we know we're not getting to scale uh, without figuring out this policy question. And, and currently it's not possible to be a worker co-op um, by, by state statute in all 50 states. So that's its own challenge. And some of the ones that have a statute, it hasn't been updated in a long time and there's like weird weird um provisions and um uh and so a lot of the advocacy is about reforming what those laws are and what it allows for in terms of investment and ownership and all kinds of things um but at the city level i think people are really understanding the extent to which this fundamentally changes the game of how we invest in community economic development 
in workforce development, in um, leadership development for communities of color, for women, uh, and women entrepreneurs, all of that stuff. And so people are coming together around sustainability solutions, climate change resilience, and forming worker co-op solutions to all of those. And so rather than going in siloed kind of nonprofit directions of saying, well, how do we address, um, how do we address women's um, economic security through some program, we can roll it all together and be like, let's invest in worker co-ops. Let's make sure that women are at the table, that people of color are at the table, that immigrants are at the table, um, that people who are dealing with gentrification and displacement are at the table. But it's one way that makes sense to legislators, um, to mayors, and you don't necessarily need to pitch it in a partisan way. Um, so whether that's the mayor of uh, Rochester, New York saying, whoa, this is my primary solution for how we're turning the city around, um, or whether it's um, in a place like Philadelphia where they've recently added, we, we won a sort of um, campaign to add worker co-op development in as a, as a line item in the city budget, um, or whether it's a place like New York City where um, city council used discretionary funds, um, first a million dollars, then two million dollars, and it's slowly increased actually over time, um, this most recent um, uh, city budget, <clears throat> they passed a $3.08 million um, allocation for supporting worker co-op development um, in New York. So to me, that's, it's just tremendous when you think about the fact that the federal government only puts eight million bucks a year toward all co-op development, um, and that's exclusively for rural co-op development, um, but that's across all different sectors, and the, 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 the amount of that that trickles down to worker co-ops is very, very little. Um, it's there and it matters and we use that for technical assistance um, to, to um, support rural communities in places like Maine or um, Arkansas. But, um, but what's happening when you can have that level of accountability and storytelling and organizing in a place, um, building coalitions for doing this work and also being there in partnership with movements for social, racial, economic and climate justice. Um, when they have something on their agenda and they want to turn out a, um, a base at a city council meeting, being able to tap into our, our members to support people, um, to support, you know, attacks against immigrants, to support people who are gender nonconforming, and have those people be there and have our backs when we're there pushing forward for legislation um, to support worker co-op development. So uh, the way that we're able to integrate reciprocal organizing to advance things has been much more effective at a very, very local level than it can be at a federal or even a state level. That's one of the questions, uh, that brings me to a question that I wanted to ask everybody on the call, and I, I imagine there might be different answers, um, but it's about this question of what are the politics of worker co-ops? Um, and I don't know if there's necessarily one right answer here, but it seems that there's an interesting tension, right? On the one hand, we're like, economic, uh, you know, hey, Worker co-ops are this totally sensible business strategy, um, and people across the political spectrum should be totally willing to embrace this um, as a pragmatic solution. And then on the other hand, there's a sense that worker co-ops should be part of a bigger movement for economic and racial justice. And unfortunately, um, the support for economic and racial justice is not exactly, um, uh, let's say it's not exactly evenly distributed among our various political parties in the U.S. Um, and certainly even within various, you know, even within our political parties, uh, there's significant differences. So I'm wondering how people navigate this tension. On the one hand, as worker co-ops, as something that points towards a, a more radical solution, a more systemic solution, uh, part of a more systemic solution um, that's maybe moving in a, a left direction, versus worker co-ops as totally sensible, like don't even worry about the politics, business solution. Um, how do people navigate this? Um, well, I can just very quickly say in my personal experience, um, not necessarily for the financial cooperative as a whole, I mean, my worker co-op is named after Emma Goldman. So, you know, clearly we are coming at it from a, from a very specific political framework. Um, but at the same time, um, one of the things that has helped us to um, establish support for worker cooperatives on a city level is, um, you know, 
or at least a citywide level. I don't mean to imply the city government is supportive of it because they're still trying to figure out exactly what they think about this whole worker co-op thing. But, you know, in Baltimore as a whole, I think there's a growing awareness of worker cooperatives and a growing interest in it. And some of it is because what we've tried to do is, um, you know, not be, um, not compromise on our personal politics, but also be very clear about the fact that you don't have to necessarily agree with our personal politics um, to support the project and to, and to benefit from it and to understand why it's relevant. So one of the things that's really, really useful for me in going out and talking to students and other businesses and other sectors about worker cooperatives is just starting with this question of what, what does it mean to have a boss and what does it mean to be your own boss? Um, and talking about some of the contradictions there, but also some of the possibilities there. Um, and I find when you really drill it down to people's daily Did we lose Kate there? Yeah, I think so. But we might have. Anybody else want to jump in on this while we see if Kate comes back? Uh, yeah, John, this is John, I'll jump in. Um, it, it, in terms of selling, in terms of selling the notion of a, a worker cooperative to a conservative um, legislator, it, it, it helps to to frame it in the context of, of traditional business, which isn't which isn't to say that that uh, your politics have to be uh, have to be changed in any fashion, but but you you want to get over the hump with them of, uh, of presenting an idea that, that they may have some sort of allergic reaction to, and and indeed these are you know cooperatives are are capitalist uh, organizations so it, it you can frame it that way uh, and, and sometimes it sells better even if you're even if your own politics are are are, are not of, of uh, a related sort okay did you we, we lost you for a second there you said when you drill down to and then you stop so do you want to finish your thought um, I think my thought was just that um, no matter uh, no matter how you're coming at it, if you have been um, an employee and somebody's been your boss, there are some shared there are some shared aspects to that and some shared stories. Um, and for me, that's where I kind of always come in on the worker ownership um, piece is what happens when you change that relationship fundamentally. Um, and that's been a really useful strategy for us in, in getting people on board with the model that we use. I think worker co-ops are fundamentally non-capitalist. I think it's up to people, movements, workers, um, to push them to be post-capitalist, meaning, hey, it's what replaces capitalism or to be anti-capitalist. I don't think that that's fundamental, um, but I do think they're fundamentally non-capitalist, which is capitalism uh, relies on an investor um, ownership model where you are meant to kick back a return on that investment to the folks who took the risk um, of investing in that, in that business. And whether those are shareholders or, or private venture capital or some other form. So when the business is 100% owned by the people who work there, even if you're pursuing a profit motive, it's not for someone else's profit, it's for yourselves. And to me, that's non-capitalist, right? Which isn't necessarily anti-capitalist, but there certainly is a lot of potential for it to be anti-capitalist. I think as the demographic shift of who's involved in worker co-ops, the very premise of saying, let's fight, for, um, let's fight for our sector to be more successful shifts. Because in 1978, when it was mostly, uh, maybe working class, white people, maybe mostly men even, um, it's one thing to say, let's fight for stronger, better conditions for ourselves. And that's mostly fighting on behalf of white working class men um, to think about it through that lens. And now that's already shifted. Like at this point, fundamentally, even just fighting for better conditions, um, more access to capital, some of the stuff that Kate was saying uh, for worker co-ops is, is already a way to advance um, immigrants' rights um, and even um, black business ownership and, and the development of, of this asset, which in the 21st century, I think, is really critical, shifting from this idea of, you know, that, that wealth through assets is done through home ownership or car ownership or some, something else, um, that I think a lot of where we're going to see the, the, um, the building of wealth in American communities is through business ownership. Um, so there is this sort of moment that's, that, that's in the balance, um, especially given the retirement um, wave of people 
who are approaching retirement age and selling their businesses, um, that that could be an opportunity to massively expand the number of people who are business owners. Um, we ourselves have, have organized, and this is through a grassroots um, initiative that came from our members, a racial and economic justice council, member council from within our members um, to be a speaker's bureau, um, to connect with one another, to help to educate the field um, and to represent our sector with that particular lens. So, I, I mean, I think it's, it's critical that we have that, that space. It, it means that we can have an accountable grassroots way to connect with folks who are outside of our movement um, and who share a politics. Um, we've done whole workshops related to the movement for black lives and how, um, how building wealth and, and addressing uh, particularly anti-black racism through worker ownership um, is a tactic that can be used. But I think that that is something that fits in within for us a larger tent um, of saying, well, here's this model, which yes, agreeing with John can appeal um, in a bipartisan or even postpartisan way to how we address fundamental economic structural um, issues in communities and, and with how enterprises want in our economy. But I think even just towing the line for who we fundamentally are without infusing any particular politics, um, we're saying that like worker ownership um, in and of itself is a way for people to get control um, of, uh, you know, of, their, of their environment and, um, and that business is not owned by capitalism, that enterprise is not the sole purview of capitalism and neither is the private sector. Um, and that in fact, movements really do need to diversify ways that we can enter those conversations, that we can demand procurement um, and purchasing power from um, universities, hospitals, governments. Um, we're one of the best solutions for doing that. And that doesn't always need to be um, a sort of capital P explicitly political um, process. So we do a lot of code switching. Um, and I think that we accountably uh, are able to represent our members in doing that and then support them where our members need to speak on their own behalf. Wonderful. Um, so I want to take one sort of synthetic question from a bunch of things that I've seen people asking. And again, there's a lot of tremendously good questions and really good discussion kind of going on in the side channel. Um, I thank people for participating in that. And for people who are looking for specific resources, um, if we didn't get it to you already, we will get it to you um, via email. Um, but there's been a bunch of questions around how worker co-ops connect to other kinds of not just, you know, we've talked about capital, we've talked about policy, we've talked about worker co-ops helping worker co-ops, but what about the broader solidarity economy? Where do we see productive linkages between worker co-ops and things like community land trusts or some uh, community development financial institutions? Um, where do we see people developing plans to invest, say, union or public pension funds in worker cooperatives? Um, so just if people have thoughts on what are the, the things you've been excited about in terms of collaboration with other kinds of solidarity economy uh, efforts. Um, this is Kate. I can mention a couple of things. Um, so we were um, very excited um, that just um, not that long ago, earlier this year, I believe, um, the working world actually became a CDFI, um, which is really tremendously important for our network. Um, we um, also are starting in the financial cooperative to see um, interest from, um, from credit unions, um, and specifically credit unions that are rooted in black communities um, that are looking to do community economic development as a part of their, um, their community strategies. Um, getting interested in the kinds of non-extractive lending that we're doing for worker cooperative and community controlled enterprises. Um, and I think that is really, really promising. Um, I think that's a really key step forward. Um, I think that um, there also have been some um, really interesting moves to try and see more collaboration between support for worker cooperatives and support for other kinds of cooperative ownership. So you mentioned land trusts, um, but also um, housing cooperatives. You know, traditionally there's been a fair amount of financial support for housing cooperatives um, and not as much for worker cooperatives. But one thing that's really interesting is starting to see some lines of communication and some lines of resonation between organizations that are supporting um, different kinds of more traditional community ownership structures um, and worker cooperatives as well. So I think that's really, um, I think that's key and I think that's gonna be a, 
a fundamental um, necessity for us in moving forward um, to figure out how to link all of those together. I think a lot of that also depends on industry. Um, so what are the opportunities to link up? Well, um, there are a lot of urban farms and worker run agricultural um, farms that are supported by or connected to community land trusts or that link up with other solidarity economy things, including CSAs and, um, and other forms of community supported agriculture um, and markets. Um, housing co-ops have incubated countless startups, some of whom might have only been around for a handful of years and closed down, um, but catering businesses, um, child care co-ops, many, many, many of them have started in housing co-ops. Um, I know this because I live in a housing co-op um, and I've seen some of these um, preschool cooperatives and things like that, other kinds of co-op businesses, um, uh, bookkeeping co-ops that, that have actually gotten their, stabilized some of these pieces um, by, by linking up with other solidarity economy institutions. So I think a lot of that happens at the anecdotal level. It's hard to see the deeper structural thing other than um, I think CDFIs, it is a little clearer. Um, what are the different financial products that a community development financial institution can offer, especially if it's explicitly marketed toward worker co-ops, then it's a little more visible. So for example, when there is a buy-in um, requirement, like Molly was talking about at the top of the webinar, um, there are CDFIs that offer loans specifically to help you um, pay for that buy-in um, in order to join a cooperative, an established cooperative, right? So if you have five grand that you're owed and you, or that you owe in order to buy into one, um, they'll make that personal loan. Um, a lot of credit unions are able to do things like that. Um, I think when we're thinking at a much more macro systemic level, um, we have the privilege of being part of those conversations as a national federation that's linked up with this, these in, this international work. Um, there's, I think there's a lot more opportunity there. Um, and to me, it's heartening that we're beginning to have those conversations in an international context as the solidarity economy um, is growing and we're, as, as awareness around growing that world um, is being legitimized. So the European Commission, for example, um, they released this whole study and report. They were like, yo, the sol solidarity economics is how we see our region economically stabilizing and growing. All this volatility of capitalism and business as usual is not very useful. So let's bolster through policies as an economic block um, all these things related to cooperatives and the solidarity economy. Great. So they started doing that for a few years and then they said, you know what? This is only going to be so helpful unless we build up partners overseas. So they sent people, they sent um, a researcher um, to North America, they interviewed folks in Mexico and their worker co-op federation up in Canada, the Canadian uh, worker co-op federation. And they came and visited our offices here in Philadelphia to talk about like, what are the instruments for making that business um, easier to happen? How do we facilitate that? Uh, whether that's currency exchange, whether that's, you know, if we were to make lend, if we were, if we were to invest or if we were to make loans, what does that look like? Who holds that? Is that through a U.S. department? Is that through a private um, equity firm? So those conversations are, are nascent, but it's to me really, really um, inspiring that they're beginning to happen because that's, I mean, this is where we're going in the 21st century. Either we're going toward oligarchy and the gig economy and neoliberalism, or we're going toward really building up the solidarity economy. Um, it seems like for the time being, both are advancing. Um, and so we're building up toward that ultimate sort of like Lord of the Rings, battle to end all battles um, a couple decades from now. So right now, it's, I think it's really important um, to build those relationships and strengthen up and shore up our own sector. I think uh, it's worth, can I just mention one last quick thing, John? Sorry. Um, I think it's worth also mentioning um, that there are, because I see a lot of folks in the chat asking about investment. There are actually, um, you know, there are some interesting strategies that are being developed for um, for putting things like pension funds and other um, institutional endowments in support of communities. Um, so for example, the financial cooperative, it's an investment fund, right? Um, it's, a, it's a fund um, that takes investments and makes them available in the form of non-extractive loans to worker cooperatives and community controlled enterprises. Um, a financial cooperative is one big um, important model for that, but it's not, it's not the only one. And our vision is to see um, lots of financial cooperatives and to see lots of revolving funds where you have um, 
institutional, um, institutional endowments who have pensions going into support um, of this kind of community controlled or worker controlled development. So there are models for that that exist. Um, and I think that continuing to grow that and to press on that, th that front and especially pressing um, institutions who make um, a lot of noise about how they want to support communities like universities and pressing them to actually take a portion of their endowment and invest it in some kind of um, a fund like the financial cooperative or another one that actually is supporting this kind of development is really key. Wonderful. And John, do you have any thoughts? Are there um, examples of uh, sustainable businesses kind of getting excited about uh, the role cooperatives play in that larger ecosystem? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the end of that question. Um, I, I don't think that that the. Uh, I think I think I'm 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 in agreement with with everything that's been said. That the only point I was trying to make earlier was that in, in terms of, uh, in terms of selling it to to people who have uh, their hands on federal money uh, or on state money, it's uh, it, you you want to you want to frame it at least initially in terms that 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 they don't react again, and. And, and personally, my, my notion of, of uh, capitalism is perhaps a little bit broader. I mean, it involves capital, i.e. money, and the ownership of assets. The difference is in worker cooperative that the assets are owned by everyone in the business rather than one or two people. Um, so that, that, that's, all, that's only where I was coming from. And uh, I'm, I'm basically in agreement with everyone. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, I wanted to just ask, um, just as a wrap-up question, um, to give our panelists a chance to say, what's one thing that people could do to support worker co-ops? Not everybody is going to be able to drop everything and, you know, become a worker cooperator. In fact, we might need, you know, school teachers and, you know, other kinds of people who are not working in uh, businesses that look like worker co-ops. So um, not everybody is going to be in a position to work. Um, what are the things people can do if they're not if they're not building a worker cooperative directly? What's the thing that they can do um, to help them grow and scale? I got this. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think really being being plugged in and supporting um, the worker associations of the worker cops themselves. We have a lot of local chapters, um, people who are organizing in places like Boston and Western Mass and the Bay Area. Um, in Madison, Wisconsin, New York, Philadelphia, even Western North Carolina. Um, so whether plugging in on the ground through them or directly through us where we are forming local chapters of the Federation, um, we are the part that doesn't get, people are like, you're doing amazing stuff and it's so do-goody. Surely you're getting all kinds of nonprofit and philanthropic grants. The answer is no. Um, we, <laughs> because, right, because we're, we're private sector. Right, we're basically um, an alternative form of organized labor, and so the best way to support it is not to support the um, all the other layers of um, education and other allied movements and stuff. But if you care about worker co-ops, plug in and support us directly. Uh, we have a sustainer program, small donors um, who can sign up to support the federation and our organizing, our lobbying, our endorsement of legislation. This is all stuff that we don't have to. Um, cater to anyone and anyone else's priorities um, due to like strings attached with funding. So we can be really real about who we are and where we're at. It also supports our R&D, which should be fund grant fundable, but it isn't. Um, so when we went to figure out healthcare, vision care, dental care for our members, uh, a 401k plan that we want to create, and we don't have the resources to actually do that research um, as of yet, those are a lot of the bottlenecks that end up being a reason why those businesses themselves are not able to scale. So little bits of investment do go a long way, um, whether that's through donations. Um, I know that a bunch of our members came together about 10 years ago and formed, um, they invested through us through a partnership with Shared Capital Cooperative, which is a CDFI based in the Twin Cities. And we formed the Worker Ownership Fund. We said, yeah, one of our issues is a lack of access to capital. So let's pull our own resources together um, and create a fund that is exclusively lending to worker co-ops. Those are the kinds of things that we're able to just whip up and create because there's no shortage of opportunities. It's just the, the platform of being able to, um, to connect up little bits of resources to have a large impact. So we appreciate the support that we have. And I see a bunch of our sustainers are actually attending this webinar. A bunch of our members are here, um, but there's even a lot of co-ops that aren't in our membership or a lot of organizations that aren't associate members 
um, or a lot of co-op developers that aren't plugged in. So those are all ways. Um, join um, the Federation as a member, as an individual supporter, um, or certainly our partners on the ground. All right, so I've got one minute each for Kate and John to give us their take on what you should do right now to support worker co-ops. Um, well, you should obviously buy from worker co-ops when you can. Um, you should encourage the institutions in your area to buy from worker cooperatives or hire worker cooperatives when they can. Um, and I think as much as possible, raising awareness about worker cooperatives by inviting cooperators to come and speak at your school, come and speak at your business, come and talk to your community, come and talk to your church. Like there are folks who are excited to do that and want to come and talk to you about cooperation. So. Invite us in and we'll do it. John? Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, someone told me recently that, that they thought uh, we should push to have uh, the co-op uh, model uh, taught at uh, land-grant universities. I thought that was really quite lovely. If you could push to have uh, state universities, community colleges, et cetera, offer as part of their curriculum the sort of the nuts and bolts of uh, running a business uh, on a collaborative basis. To, uh, I think that might, might go a long way. Wonderful. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. Um, webinars are always strange because you can't get applause, um, but I think these panelists really deserve a round of applause. So I don't even know if you can paste that clap in the chat. Um, but uh, thank you so much. And I want to turn it over to Esteban, uh, to Eli, to wrap it up and bring us home. Yeah, um, just want to thank everybody. We had about, uh, on average, about 300 uh, people concurrently streaming throughout. Um, people were coming and going, but we like we stood around 300 with about well, around 250 on 275 on Zoom and like 50 on Facebook, which was really cool. Um, for folks who registered, um, we will send an email in a couple of days with a bunch of links um, and a recording. Um, if you know people that should see this, feel free to share that recording. At, tell them to, to register. And even if they register like in three hours, they'll still get the recording. Um, thank you for attending. Um, go support the organizations that were on this call. Support the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, uh, DOWIE, uh, the Working World, Democracy Collaborative, um, the New Economy Coalition. Uh, we need your support. Um, we need this movement needs to grow, and I think it's ready to grow. And you can see that with how much interest there is in these strategies. Um, move your money and support, and get involved in the worker co-ops in your community. Um, and thank you all so much. And, and we'll see you uh, next time we do something like this. Bye, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.